I'm not a surgeon, but I do uh, offer surgical procedures for the right price. And, and so I'd like to talk to you, I'd like to impress you with a little bit of medical knowledge by talking about something I learned about recently called mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are brain cells located in our body. And what they do is when, when we receive some kind of external stimulus, they process them in a way that's very interesting because... We may just be observing something, but the mirror neuron does not differentiate between whether we're just seeing what's going on or whether we're experiencing what's going on. Nova did a special on this and and explained why for people who get very excited about sports, all right, so if you go to a sports bar and people are getting all bent out of shape, uh, whether the team is winning or losing, or if this is happening at home, uh, it, it's, it's the, the mirror neuron in us is, is pulling from what's called our implicit memory, all right, not our conscious memory, things we remember like, I had waffles for breakfast, but, but things that have happened to us throughout our life, moments when we have been in moments uh, or situations where we have been in competition, and it pulls out of us this memory, and we literally are experiencing a moment of winning versus losing, and it excites our body. It incites our body as if we were in the game. Now, likewise, let me uh, have you imagine something, and you'll never forgive me for this, but work with me. I want you to picture, close your eyes, and picture a paper cut. All right. Oh, just a big, nice paper cut. <laughs> All right. Now, if your body, and you can open your eyes again, uh, if your body reacted to that at all, You know, if you got the chills, that's your mirror neuron. Because you've had a paper cut in your life. And and it and it and it brings to mind, even though I was just saying, imagine a paper cut, it was as if you were experiencing that paper cut. Or if you see somebody walking heights and your palms get sweaty, same thing, you're not walking heights. If you see somebody carrying a big stack of packages and you're afraid for them that they're going to drop uh, the packages, same thing going on. It's the body's inability to tell the difference between what is happening and what you are observing. I bring this up because the disciple Peter triggers my mirror neurons. I used to think, well, he's just kind of a bumbling fool. You know, he's one of the more fleshed out characters of the Bible, actually. Uh, I I would put him as one of the top ten more realized characters in the Bible. Because what we see constantly throughout his time with Jesus is where he makes these really foolish pronouncements or he does really foolish things in response to Jesus' revelation of who he is. And I always cringe a little bit. Uh, there's, there's a moment where, um, you know, Jesus is walking on water, and Peter gets so excited. Something goes on, that light turns on inside of him. And, and he says, oh, I can walk on water. And so he gets out there, he starts walking on water, and he drops in. Then there's a time when Jesus says, hey, guess what? You know, part of the plan is that I'm going to die and rise again. Well, Peter, again, this lights, this this is this wonderful person, this messenger from God, and he says, absolutely not is this going to happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. There is a time when uh, Peter is, um, he's he's 
Jesus is up praying, right? And the night he was betrayed. And Peter's sleeping. And the people come to arrest Jesus. And, and Peter wakes up. And his response is to grab a sword. And he's getting ready to, you know, do some damage to the people that came to arrest Jesus. But the point is he missed that Jesus already won that moment. Jesus said, God, not my will, but your will. That was the victory. Not creating more bloodshed. Not creating more division. This was Jesus going through with the plan that he had been trying to get into the heads of people for ages. How about Jesus to back up just a little bit? When Jesus is is washing the feet of his disciples and Peter's like, no, not so much. And Jesus says, no, you know, we have to do this because this is a fulfill everything. And he says, well then, Jesus, wash everything. So there's these moments where it just, blah, stuff comes out of his mouth. And, 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 I, and I'm not meaning any disrespect for him because, like I say, motor neurons, mirror, mirror neurons trigger in me. Because, um, and this may be a made-up story, but I just had a CT scan a week ago, and they determined that my brain is directly linked to my larynx. And that is to say, <laughs> that is to say, anything that comes into my mind, I say. I can't help it. All right, that might be a made-up story. <laughs> I'll tell you if it is. Um, so uh, Peter, here's the deal with Peter. He gets excited, and in his excitement, he gets very confused. And if you were to create Peter in a laboratory, here's the, I, I created a recipe for Peter. Write it down if you wish. It's very simple. Peter equals passion. A response to Jesus. All right? Inspiration. So, he's one part passion. He's also one part lack of understanding. Doesn't quite get it. And then he's also one part lack of impulse control. And together they create this wonderful figure who ultimately is deemed worthy to lead the early Christians. The beauty of Jesus is when he chose the disciples, he didn't go and choose the brightest. He didn't go and choose the most stable. He went and he chose people like you and I. If Jesus was in this room today and he's looking for 12 people, he would find 12 people. No matter what you think of yourself, you might be one of them. His point wasn't to assemble a brain trust. It was to assemble real people who would respond. For whom the light would go on inside. And they would act. However imperfectly. So today, the transfiguration. Oh my goodness. What an awkward story. The transfiguration, well... A sacrament, one of the definitions we teach the kids about a sacrament is it is an external sign of an internal reality. Okay, so whether it is baptism, whether it is uh, communion, and today we don't call it a sacrament, but that transfiguration is, is, is littered with symbolism. And what that symbolism, that external symbolism does is it reveals the internal truth of who Jesus is. So first of all, they're on a mountaintop. Now that mountaintop has a great meaning. It's not coincidental that they're on a mountaintop. Of course, if you look at the Old Testament, where did Moses get all his intel? From the mountaintop. All right? And then, on top of that, you have this cloud 
descending upon them. Well, that isn't because it's bad weather. It's because it represents the presence of God amongst them. Then there's Moses and Elijah showing this, this continuity of the tradition that Jesus is fulfilling. And if you really, really need overt symbolism in your Bible stories, there's the voice of God saying, this is my son, listen to him. This is an incredible moment that reveals quite clearly who Jesus is. And it's one where I would suggest the proper response the acceptable response of the disciples would have been to be silently awestruck. To bask in this moment of holiness. The light, the voice of God, the vision of these great people, the symbolism, the meaning of it all. And then Peter, who the Bible says didn't know what to say, doesn't let that stand in his way. <laughs> he says, God, oh, Jesus, here's what we need to do. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to build a shelter for Elijah. I'm going to build a shelter for Moses. I'm going to build a shelter for you. Why? Who knows? <laughs> It just, blah, it comes out of him. All right? Head, larynx, it just comes out of him. He receives this beautiful recurring jolt of passion. A love for Jesus. Jesus is transfigured. But throughout his time with Jesus, Peter is constantly changed from forgetting to remembering. Forgetting to remembering. And this is a moment of remembering and it comes out in a real uncool way. But can we look at this story instead of saying, oh, Peter, what an unusual guy you are. Appreciate the fact that in his excitement, we first see the manifestation of God within an individual. The inspiration, the light of God. And so this is, I think, one of the lessons we can get from the Transfiguration. One of the lessons we can get from Peter's life is don't be hard on yourself. If you picture yourself an awkward Christian, a Christian who says stupid things now and again, who doesn't respond as well as you wish to, who's too dour, who's too dour, Who's too serious? Who's too ignorant to the plight of things going on in the world that need help? Can we practice first appreciating the fact that that God is speaking to us and that the practice of life is to refine that into a more perfect expression. This morning, while um, people ask, do I write these sermons? Which I either take as a compliment or as a... <laughs> I don't. And I do. I do. They, they, I, have, I, I, have, I have manuscripts. All right, so I do write them. On the way in today, I thought, you know, here's, here's another application of this lesson. And so it's not going to be in the manuscript, um, but it's this. I'm done. And hate's a strong word, but I'm going to use it. I'm done hating other Christians. What's the date today? 
February 19th, 2012, I give up hating other Christians. I have loved people from different faith traditions. Islam is a beautiful faith tradition. Hinduism is a beautiful faith tradition. Judaism is a beautiful faith tradition. And what I do is I ignore that they have in their traditions things that I would find offensive. But because they're not my direct nuclear family, so to speak. I say, oh, that's beautiful. And I overlook the things I disagree. But when I read the news, when I look at other Christians, I criticize them. I'm harder on them. Because I disagree with the way that the Spirit enters them and is manifest. And I've been that way for as long as I can remember. Is it possible, and this is a big year, every election year is a big year for this, can I look at the Christians Literally, my brothers and sisters in this tradition that we belong to. And can I find beauty in the fact that God speaks to them? That they act out of an inspiration. That God lights that fire within them. But that because of pathology, because of socialization, because of culturalization, whatever it is, they respond in a different way, just as they look at me and may not feel very positive about me as a Christian. I can't wait for them to love me as a Christian. I will die at the old age of 120 but I can start today by refusing to be a part of the machinery that cuts down people of other faith traditions, whether it's Christianity or other faith traditions outside of Christianity, and putting them down because I disagree with the way they do their faith. I will love first the fact that God makes no distinction between me and the people that I've called evil. And I repent for having called them evil. It's wrong in my book. Might be right in your book, it's wrong in my book. I will focus on that inmost light. I will still assert what I think is right in the society for how to treat other people, I will still assert that God calls us to a very simple mission. Love God, love our neighbor, love ourself. And all else is frivolity. All action should emanate from that. But my prayer for me, my prayer for you, my prayer for this world, is that we can look inside Everybody we see, see that flame. See that inspiration. And not only be inspired by it, but be changed by it. Amen.